In 1976, Steve Wozniak developed Apple's first product, called the Apple One. This was just a single circuit board of Steve's own design. To finance the production of the Apple One computer, Steve Wozniak sold his cherished HP 65 calculator, and his friend Steve Jobs sold his VW Microbus, and the Apple One became a reality. It was first demoed in 1976 in July at the Homebrew Computer Club in Palo Alto, California. The Apple I was the predecessor of the Apple II, which came out a year later in 1977, and the Apple II was part of the so-called 1977 Trinity, which also included the Commodore PET and the TRS-80. About 200 Apple I's were produced, this was a turning point in personal computers because up to that point other competing personal computers such as the Altair 8800 were natively pro uh, accessed and programmed by banks of toggle switches and LEDs while the Apple I only needed a keyboard such as this ASCII keyboard and some sort of a TV or video monitor to be immediately accessible and useful. Since Wozniak was the only person at Apple who could really provide support for the Apple I computer, Apple encouraged Apple I owners to trade in and upgrade to Apple IIs, and the Apple Ones that were turned in were uh, basically trashed or destroyed in some way. Thus, today there is very few remaining Apple Ones, and their rarity makes them exceedingly expensive for anybody who wishes to play around with them. Various Apple I clones and emulators have been produced, and this video is about the Replica One produced by Brielle Computers and currently sold by ReactiveMicro.com. Here's the Brielle Computers website. It's just BrielleComputers.com. And all the information on the uh, replica one is available on this website but Brielle Computers no longer sells the products and uh, gradually starting with the replica one support and production of the kits is being handled through another company reactivemicro.com which uh, seems to be in the business of providing support and parts for the old Apple products um, and here they have their page for the Briel replica one depending on how you get it the price can vary a bit when I purchased my replica one kit it was available for $150 I also purchased the PS2 keyboard adapter since it requires a PS2 type keyboard uh, that was uh, an additional $6 and then a suitable power supply, even though I probably could have purchased one somewhere else. They had a fair price of $10 for that. So it totaled out at $178.88, including shipping, which is a fair price. I think uh, Brielle wanted about $199 when they were selling this kit. So here's the kit as received from Reactive Micro. The uh, manual itself was downloaded from the, um, I believe from the Briel Computers website. I forget which one I got it from. I think it's available on both the Briel and the Reactive websites actually. It's a setup, assembly, and user's manual. And it's about 30 some odd pages. I just printed it out on my uh, color laser. I like to have hard copy manuals for things. And this is the kit itself along with the power supply and the PS2 adapter that I bought along with it. So the main thing about the Replica 1 is that it is really the same basic design and architecture as the original Apple 1, but it dispenses with all the glue logic by incorporating that into one or two newer technology ICs, but it still uses the same 6502 microprocessor, still has the same features, and uh, architecturally behaves the same way, even though the implementation is done using 
newer technology and it keeps the price way down. Plus many of the old chips aren't really available anymore that were used if you wanted to make it with the original exact circuit. So we've got a bag of little parts here and nicely the uh, kit includes the ICs and the sockets which is a, and they're good quality sockets too, they're nice uh, screw machine sockets and then a nice circuit board so there's the front of the circuit board and there's the rear of the circuit board this is obviously a much smaller computer than the original Apple one and this is all due to the uh, compression of all that glue logic that took up the majority of the board and of course the RAM in those days was very inefficient took up a lot of board real estate uh, just to get you know a few kilobytes of memory and of course today we can have one small chip that has gobs of memory on it so there's another space savings that the replica one uses however the interface points are the same it still has the uh, keyboard interface, it still has a uh, composite video output, it still has the expansion connectors on the side which are compatible with accessories for the original Apple One. There are the IC sockets. I believe this is the USB adapter um, sub board. The EEPROM, I think that's the RAM there's a parallax propeller microcontroller which handles almost all of the functions that would be normally handled by everything else on the board except for the the memory and the microprocessor and I think this is a PIA chip it's a 6821 yeah so that's let's see there it is 6821 and then the 6502 so we have a Hitachi 6821 and a Rockwell 6502. So those are just like the chips that were on the original board, but then all the glue logic is taken care of by this Parallax propeller microcontroller, which I looked it up and it's really kind of a remarkable chip. It's actually something like, I think I read 32 different microcontrollers all in the same chip, and they can communicate with, with each other. I'm presuming that only part of the capability of this chip is being utilized for this uh, replica one purpose and there's your um, RAM I don't even know what that is 6225 or 62256 I think that's what it is and that is really just a couple of other chips you know TTL chips that are in there for one reason or another. You've got your edge connector. All of the different resistors are nicely um, labeled and stuck in individual bags for each value which is something I've never seen any kit producer do. It's really a nice touch. Same thing goes with the capacitors. Uh, there's one electrolytic which is not in a bag. There's your PS2 connector, your composite video connector, power switch, a couple of push button switches which uh, duplicate the functions of the original two push buttons on the original Apple One. And there's the crystal and a couple of uh, shunt jumpers. And that's what you get. So just a quick overview of the manual before I get started building this. Um, Brio computers and El Cajon California. My understanding that Vince wanted to get out of having to support the various products he designed but he wanted them to continue to be available so um, the guys at Reactive Micro or the guy, I'm not sure how big the company is, um, have been stepping up to take over that product line as far as distribution goes. So there's a bit of a history of the Apple One and the Replica One. There's an index, something a lot of people producing manuals for kits these days forget to put in, so you're left just flipping around trying to find the good sections. But 
it includes the history as I've already talked about, the unpacking and setup, kit assembly, programming using the USB to serial interface, using the Crusader assembler and troubleshooting, and then various uh, technical documents in the appendices. There's the history again, a picture of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. And I should point out that uh, apparently Steve Wozniak owns the rights to the Apple I since he developed it before Apple Computers was incorporated and that Vince Briel got permission from Steve Wozniak to produce this kit and presumably use the same firmware. So there's a bit of an overview of the Replica 1 the on-off switch, the USB to serial interface, and power supply source. It has a breadboard area just like the original Apple One did. The PS2 keyboard connector, the composite video, 44-pin Apple One style expansion slot and edge connector. So you have both male and female. Just like the original, there's a socket for an ASCII keyboard if you happen to have one. It's compatible with Apple II ASCII keyboards. There is a uh, shunt jumper to enable that keyboard. There is a clear button and a reset button. And then you've got the uh, limited additional serial number, which I don't think mine has. The, the one with the red circuit board is uh, produced by Briel as a limited edition and it says so here, the um, version that's being sold by Reactive Micro is the same design as the uh, limited edition, but it does not have the limited edition serial number, nor does it have the red um, solder mask on it like that one did. And then you have a ROM selection shunt jumper over here and the power LED, and that's about it. You've got your basic architecture of the, rep of the Replica 1. There's the EEPROM, the RAM, a little bit of address decoding, the 6502 processor, the 6821 PIA, which provides two parallel ports or 8-bit ports. And those are being used uh, for the video controller, the PS2 controller, serial I.O., all that stuff. And at some point in there, the propeller um, chip does a lot of work. You've got an unpacking and setting up, identification of components, parts list, some basic stuff having to do with the identification of components. Pretty well done, it looks like. Well, if I could turn this page, I could move on. So there's still more assembly going on here. It shows you a picture of every part before it tells you to assemble it. Then it gets into the basic testing before installing the ICs. Then there's talk about using the WAS monitor. The Replica 1 can be programmed in one of three basic or three built-in ways. You can enter values into memory directly using the WAS monitor. Another way is to use the basic program that's built into ROM. And uh, the third way is to program the Replica 1 using the Crusader assembler, which was written by Ken Wesson. So it has basic instructions for using the WAS monitor. More of that, how to get into BASIC, and then um, it assumes you already know how to use BASIC, so it's only about a third of a page there. And then uh, how to access the Crusader Assembler, how to change the boot ROMs, how to use the USB to serial interface to a terminal emulator. And 
and it gives specific instructions on how to do things using the popular free TerraTerm terminal emulator, which is one I also use on some of my other vintage computers, such as my Altair 8800. Now here's more detailed instructions on the Crusader assembler. Then there's some troubleshooting, the ASCII keyboard pinout, the memory map of the Replica 1, a listing of the WAS monitor, which was famously something less than 256 bytes to do the whole thing, so that's all spelled out here. And we're down to the last page, and then there's a warranty. So I'm starting out by putting in the sockets. The uh, manual recommends starting with the resistors, but I find it's best to start with IC sockets. And now that all the sockets are in, I'm putting in all the resistors. And then the crystal, the power switch, and the two reset and clear buttons. And now for the capacitors. I always like to check the value of capacitors whose values I can't read um, using my digital LC bridge. So these are supposed to be 0 0.01 microfarads or 10 nanofarads. That one's coming in at uh, almost 12. And the other one in the same bag is coming in quite low, but these are not critical value parts. And these are some 0.1 microfarad or 100 nanofarads. So I have to change my meter up one notch. Yep, that's looking good. One thing about these smaller capacitors is that the Kelvin connector on this bridge doesn't really have enough uh, spacing to accommodate them very well. It's right on the edge of the connector. I can splay the leads, but then I have to straighten them out again to put them in the boards. So it looks like all those are correct. And all the disk capacitors are now installed. And the single electrolytic capacitor. And next, the LED and the 4401 transistor are installed. And then the couple of shunt jumper posts for the ASCII enable, or that's the ASCII keyboard enable, and the ROM selector. Apparently you can select between the integer basic and the AppleSoft basic. The included power supply, at least if you buy it included, has a, um, what is that, it's a mini USB plug on it, so the power is provided over USB. I think earlier versions of this kit may have used a barrel connector or something for the power supply. Anyway, uh, there's this pre-manufactured, uh, let's see who put it, oh it's a SparkFun, okay, a SparkFun USB adapter which has got the controller chip on it for USB and there is looks like a, li a little uh, slide switch on there it looks like you can use it to select the voltage that it's going to run at and then there's the mini USB socket on there and then two 9-pin headers which in my case came already soldered onto this adapter even though the instructions say that I have to do that myself and it just goes right down here on the circuit board at this point this is how the power from the power supply gets onto the circuit board and also if you want to communicate via um, USB then this is the way to do it the kit doesn't come with a schematic and since all the pinout designations for this are on the bottom of the board, 
and I think normally SparkFun would have you plugging this into a breadboard or something. Um, I wanted to make sure I took a picture of the bottom side of this. It just makes it a little easier to figure what's what if I need to scope it out later on. And now that's soldered onto the board. And finally the PS2 connector and the composite video output connector are soldered on. Now there's a small problem with the edge connector. It hangs over the circuit board mounting holes. So I'm guessing, yeah, and the photos in the manual show a connector that doesn't have the screw mounting ears. Uh, so this is obviously a substitution. I think the proper thing to do is just cut those ears off. And so the edge connectors now soldered on. Big improvement with the mounting ears cut off. Well, according to the data sheet I downloaded, this little switch here determines whether this board provides uh, power to this board at 3.3 volts or 5 volts. It can actually provide other voltages, but the way this SparkFun board is set up, you only have the choice of 5 volts or 3.3 volts. Since I'm... well, everything on here from the 6502 and the TTL Logic chips would expect 5 volts, so I'm going to make sure this switches in the 5 volt position, which it is by default. So with the included power supply plugged into the board via the USB adapter module, I'm going to turn on the power switch and I get the power LED. Then I'm going to take these convenient test points and test between ground and 5 volts. And I have that. And between ground and 3.3 volts. And I have that within reason. I believe all those voltages are coming entirely from this because there's no other voltage regulator parts on the board. Checking across the power supply pins of the 7400 Logic IC socket. Make sure I have 5 volts there. And the same thing for the 74138. The next step after the voltage checks is to install the Parallax Propeller microcontroller which is responsible for video generation and also it's supporting 24LC256 which looks like it should be a little op amp or a 555 timer or something from that package but in reality it's a uh, EEPROM in a serial I.O. package so it is actually the EEPROM for the parallax chip and contains everything it needs to know although it communicates with the parallax serially therefore it doesn't need all the pins so the next step is to power this up with just that and a video monitor connected and see if at least the video section is working so I have this little video monitor here which is um, one of the many that are out here on the market it's uh, VGA HDMI uh, composite video um, and it also has a composite video input for um, with a BNC connector for use with CCTV systems it also has a USB uh, connector so you can play media stored on a USB uh, memory stick and it also has a couple of built-in speakers so there's a left and right um, audio input as well sort of a nice little universal monitor so with that all plugged in, I'm going to turn on the circuit here. And it's generating a screen full of garbage, but it's intelligible garbage, which means the video section is working. So I turn that back off. So all the ICs are now plugged in. And the next test is to power it back up and press the reset button 
and after a couple of seconds we should see if the replica one resets properly and if all that's working correctly I should get a backslash followed by the cursor with the at symbol moving to the next line. Okay, so the monitor's ready. I'm gonna power it up. And we get the screen full of garbage, which is what the Apple One originally did as well. And now I push the reset button. And see if anything happens. Hmm, nothing happened. Try the reset button pushing it for a couple seconds. Oh, there is a flashing ampersand down there. Let's try that again. Okay, powering it up. There is an ampersand down there. Oh, something happened. Let's try pushing the reset button. That doesn't seem to be quite right, does it? Got something there. push the reset. Nothing really happens when I push the reset. Well, it's my turn to feel really stupid, obviously having a bad eyesight day. I could have sworn I had these two chips plugged in correctly because I, I mean, I looked at them a couple of times, but I didn't see the notches correctly, and I had both these chips pointing in the wrong direction. So, assuming they haven't been blown up in some way by having them inserted backwards, I'm going to try it again. So, wait a couple of seconds, now I push the reset button. And it gave me a slash over here and a flashing at symbol. If I push reset again, I get that. So that's a good sign. Maybe not all is lost. I plugged in an old PS2 keyboard here. Just see if anything happens. Look at that. I reset it again. And actually clear the screen by pushing that clear button on the board. So I'm just going to check my numbers out here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. Okay, it seems like all the important keys are working. So I'm going to try clearing this out again and clearing the screen. And I've got the uh, flashing at symbol, which according to the manual means I'm in the WAS monitor by default. So I can try. Um, examining memory location 300. So I'm going to type in I'm not getting a real crisp focus on this. So I've got 300 in there. I push return and it gives me not what I expected. So let's try that again. 300 return. There we go. It's really out of focus here. Let's see. 
it seems to not want to focus on the screen it wants to focus better on the um, frame so I'm gonna kinda keep it over here so it returns a value there which is what's currently in memory location 300 if I type the same thing it gives me the same answer so that value didn't turn to display a block of memory type the starting location followed by a period follow that with the ending location so 300.32 uh, it needs a better address than that 300.32F and there we go it's giving me a good memory dump so the WAS monitor is basically working I need to send execution to memory location E000 and then R for run so I'm going to clear the screen again and put in E000 R for run and I get something I did not expect it just gave me 4C to start the replica one and enter basic type the turn on the replica and push reset now I'll try typing in E 000R and now I get this backslash, which um, maybe I was in basic already. I think I was actually. That little um, forward uh, arrow is supposed to be the prompt for basic. Let me try that again. Reset E zero zero zero. R. So I'm going to try it again. I'm going to reset. Actually, I'm going to clear the screen first. Push reset. Now I'm in the WAS monitor. Now I type E 000R. Push enter and it returns that address with a 4C after it which is the contents of that location but the cursor has changed so now I have the little right facing arrow so I'm going to try typing a little basic program for I equals 1 2 oops. oh this doesn't have a backspace ah. So let me just blast it out. Didn't like it. Syntax error. 10 for I. I. Ah. I'm holding the camera with one hand and typing with the other and looking in the wrong place, so I'm making mistakes. So let's try it again. 10 for I equals 1. To 10. I don't know if it can work without spaces or not. So it accepted that. 20. Print I. Got that in. 30. Next I. If I type in list, it lists the program. If I type in run, it prints the numbers 1 through 10 and it had an error because I did not give it an end command probably this version probably requires that so I'm going to put in a line 40 and type end list again now type run ah did it without the error message now so the basic is running 
and this is the original Apple One Basic as obtained from Steve Wozniak. Um, it is not the um, the more advanced basic which was available later and that is apparently available via this jumper here which I can tell it to use that one instead. Now there's also the uh, the Crusader assembler and if I reset I'm back into the WAS monitor and now I can type F000R and I get this and I could program in some assembly stuff. There's nothing in the manual at least at this point telling me what kind of prompt I should get from doing that. But it's clear that the Apple One clone, the Replica One, is basically functioning at this point. I'll try to do a little more of a demonstration to show it doing a little bit more. I also want to try to clear up the garbage on this screen. It's showing a lot of bleeding colors and I suppose that's maybe because the um, the code is not that crisp. I might be able to put this monitor into a monochrome mode that might fix it up a little bit. So it seems like there's no way to avoid getting all sorts of reflections on this little monitor. That's a problem with it. It's just doesn't matter what I do, it's going to have some undesirable thing in the picture. So uh, I'm back at the WAS monitor here. I'm going to type in this again so I can get into the Crusader. Oops, let's see. So back at the WAS monitor, I'm going to try the F000R again. And that does not work. But if I type E000R, that gets me into basic. And if I type F000R, that doesn't like me. There it goes. Why did it work one time and not the next? I don't know. I've tried this. Um, it worked that time, but boy, there's some trick to it. Try resetting again. F000R. See? It didn't work. So it's almost like I had to do it twice. Let me try resetting again. F000R. And that time it worked perfectly. So I don't know. Anyway, you can get into the Crusader uh, assembler this way. And they give you a little um, test program in the manual to try it out. So the question mark is the prompt letting you know you're in the assembler. And um, type N for a new program and it prompts with 000 which is the first line of the address. Press a space bar to skip the first field used in naming code blocks. The assembler tabs over to the new field, like that. Type 
LDA. I think there's a space there. So that should be the load accumulator. And it seems to be ready for that. 001 is displayed, then type loop and press the space bar to the next field. JSR F E F So that's uh a D C space pound dollar sign one C M P if not equal loop and return from subroutine type L to list the code oops type L to list the code and it looks like it's saying to load the accumulator with a, then start a loop, which is a jump to subroutine, and um, yeah. So let's see, then type A to assemble it. To run the program, type R. and it prints out the alphabet. So it did successfully assemble a little machine language program and we've run it. So that's working. Type RTS which routines returns to the Crusader assembler shell. Well, that didn't work. Oh! It didn't mean me to type it it returns to the assembler shell when it encounters the RTS command. Alright. So... Um, how do you get out of this thing? Let's see. I want to go back to... Oh, let's see, run E000. So I'm back into basic, so that did work. I told the assembler to run the program starting at E000, which I knew was where BASIC was located, so it did go into BASIC and I could do that. Um, so the WAS monitor works, BASIC works, and the Crusader assembly works. And um, It also says in the manual, now that I've experienced the Replica 1 like it was with Apple 1, I can use the new revised version of AppleSoft Basic that was modified to work with the Replica 1. Place the jumper on the ROM select with the power switch in the off position. So I go down here and I put the little jumper in position. Turn it back on like normal. 
wait for it to clear out push reset like zero like usual now when I turn I'm gonna actually push clear and now reset and now I'm gonna do the E 000R now I get this different prompt there we go which is familiar to anybody who's used Apple II's this is the uh, the prompt cursor symbol for basic they uh, point out in the manual that even though this is basically AppleSoft basic it's sort of a light version of AppleSoft basic because there was not room in the ROM to include the graphics commands so uh, in order to make it fit in less than 8k that was available they had to strip that out but um, I expect this will have more editing capabilities so I should be able to put in for I equals 1 to 10 20 print I 30 and there I mistyped it so no it doesn't let me back up so I just have to syntax out of there and retype it So that's running the um, AppleSoft Basic Lite. It's my alternate operating system. So in addition to the things I've already demonstrated the Replica 1 doing, such as running the WAS monitor for pure machine language programming and memory examination and so on, and using the Crusader Assembler to write machine code in an assembly language format, and to run two different versions of BASIC. Uh, it's also possible to run the Replica 1 from another computer such as an IBM PC using any of the available terminal emulator programs such as TerraTerm. And in that case that computer that's running TerraTerm will be the thing that powers the Replica 1 over the USB cord instead of using the uh, wall wart power supply. Um, in that case, it is now possible to utilize uh, the power of that additional uh, software to do loads and saves, and you could actually, you know, write programs and and save them on the PC. And in theory, if you were to get a hold of any of the adapters that were available for the Apple One, such as the cassette interface that would commonly be plugged in here that could be inserted in here and it would run just like it would on the Apple One and uh, thereby be able to load and save your programs even without using something like TerraTerm on another computer. So I hope you found this little documentary on the real Replica One computer to be interesting.